Okay, welcome. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening. My name is Dr. Brian Henning. I'm a professor of philosophy and environmental studies here at Gonzaga University, and I'm the director of the new Center for Climate Society and the Environment. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Thanks for joining us. The Gonzaga Center for Climate Society and the Environment was founded in April of this year, uh, informed by an abiding commitment to justice and concern for the planet. The Center for Climate Society and the Environment serves Gonzaga and the Inland Northwest region by promoting innovative teaching, scholarship, research, consulting, and capacity building on that intersection of climate society and the environment. It's my pleasure to welcome you who are here today and also uh, those of you who are at home. Before we uh, introduce our speakers this evening, I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous people who have been part of this land for more than 10,000 years. In the spirit of the Jesuit practice of composition of place, we acknowledge that Gonzaga University resides on the homelands of the Spokane tribal people. This land holds the cultural DNA and the spirit of the first people of this place, the people of the river. And it is this, their ancestors who are here and bring forth the power of this place, the knowledge that comes from the land. We are grateful to be on this land and ask for its support as we work to manifest our intentions during this gathering of hearts, minds, and spirits. If you are joining us online from somewhere else in the world and you want to acknowledge the indigenous people on whose land you reside, feel free to share that in the chat. And now it's my very distinct pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening. Dr. Carolyn Cunningham is Associate Professor of Communication and Leadership Studies at Gonzaga University. Dr. Cunningham earned a BA in Women's Studies from the University of Southern Maine and an MA and PhD in Radio, Television, and Film from the University of Texas at Austin. She teaches courses in communication theory, digital media, and women in leadership. Her research looks at the intersections of gender and technology, and she's the author of Games Girls Play and the editor of the book Social Networking and Impression Management. Her research has been published in several journals, including the Journal of Children and Media and the New Media and Society. Please join me in welcoming to the front, Dr. Cunningham. With us this evening, we also have our very own Dr. Heather Crandall. Dr. Crandall is Associate Professor and Chair of Communication Studies here at Gonzaga. She earned her BA and MA in Communication Studies and PhD in Media Studies, Rhetoric, and American Studies at Washington State University. Here at Gonzaga, she teaches in Rhetoric and Civil Life, excuse me, Civic Life, Understanding Meaning Making, Analyzing Public Text and Discourse. The rhetoric of social change and also the senior seminar. Professor Crandall serves as the book review editor of Communication Research Trends, and she's an affiliated faculty in the Women's and Gender Studies Department, and she serves on the board of the Northwest Alliance for Media Literacy. Her research interests include rhetoric and social change, communication pedagogy, and techno-feminism, something we'll learn about tonight. Please join me in welcoming her as well. We're eager to learn all about the climate girl effect. Thank you so much for being here with us. Yeah, thanks for coming. And I'm, I wasn't practicing with a microphone, but we're gonna we're gonna go with it. We're gonna go. Okay, so thank you for coming, and I think we're gonna start off with. Yeah. Okay, so raise your hand if you have heard of Greta. Nope. Try it again. Raise your hand if you have heard of Greta. There, there we go. Oh, okay. Do we all remember Greta sailing across the ocean in 2019? I see some nods. Yes, yes. Do we remember her UN speech? Hands up. Yeah. What do you remember about it? Somebody over here. Blame on older people. Someone in the middle here. UN speech? Yes. Outdated policies. Outdated policy. Someone from this side? I don't know how emotional. Emotional. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Now raise your hand if you've ever heard of Little Miss Flint. A couple, less people. Yeah. Uh, what is she famous for? Please get closer to the mic. Okay, thank you. What is she famous for, Little Miss Flint? Anyone know? Jonathan. 
activism, activism around the uh, lead in flint water or the water in flint. Yes, very good. So she, we're going to be talking about her today. Uh, and the last thing we want to ask is, how many of you have ever participated in a school climate strike? Oh, a couple. Awesome. We ask these questions because we see that girls are leading in the climate justice movement. And we started to ask ourselves what it means for girls to be out front on this. Um, and we also asked ourselves, how are girls leading differently than others in the climate justice movement, particularly adults and men? Uh, we asked ourselves about how media covered their activism. And then we were also curious about how they're strategically using digital media uh, for their strategy, because we're interested in techno feminism, which we'll be talking about today as well. And we wondered what it means for girls to start out as climate activists at like eight years old, and then to grow up uh, as teenagers in the public eye. So over the past year, we tried to answer all these questions about the most high profile climate girl activists. And we identified what we're calling a climate girl effect, which we'll talk about today. So we use a variety of perspectives. We analyze their social media use and their media coverage of their activism and then just their trajectories. And in some in instances, we interview them. And we drew on uh, girlhood studies, which really questions the adult uh, focus of uh, feminist scholarship. So we were trying to understand what is it about girls uh, that we want to learn about and their culture. And some of those girlhood studies um, criticizes adult and white feminist scholarship that lacks an intersectional perspective. And some of that feminist scholarship um, looks at girls becoming women but rather than taking them seriously in their own right. And so we also recognize that as adult white women, uh, we have a lot of blind spots. So in our research, we also drew on black feminist scholarship as well as indigenous scholars to help us analyze uh, our research. So in the next hour, we're excited to share some of our findings with you. All right, so we're gonna give you a little preview. Can you guys hear me now in the back there with the microphone? So first, we're going to talk about what we call the Greta effect. Um, she's a source of inspiration, but also hatred among many. And so we're asking, why is she so uh, polarizing? Uh, she's making a real difference, uh, is what we're finding. So people are cutting back on their air travel, for example, because she does. Um, people who've heard of her are more likely to make lifestyle changes uh, to support the environment. But she's also been the target of vitriol. Um, for example, uh, a journalist in Chinese media actually really questioned if she actually is a vegan because of her weight. So that's kind of horrible. So next, uh, we will talk about the Flint girl effect because it shows us a very different way that girls are participating in climate activism. It's a good example of environmental justice of, of the environmental justice movement whose goals are to fight for envi environmental protection for communities of color and for communities. Okay, and then third, our third case study, we're gonna talk about indigenous climate girls because they face very different contexts than either Greta or Little Miss Flint. And then we'll end with techno-feminism because that is what drew us to this research are the many ways that girls are designing technologies to address the climate crisis. And this is important because women are underrepresented in STEM um, and there's a new generation of climate girls that are using technology as a way forward. And uh, I think we'll have some questions at the end. So let's go. All right, let's go. So of course, for some context, it's no secret, we're in a climate crisis. And in, in this all, we start to see it gather momentum in 2015 when 196 parties come together at the UN Climate Change Conference um, and decide that they're, we're going to have to cooperate globally and hold each other accountable to address this problem, right? And most recent reports, as you know, uh, paint a dire picture of how nations need to act to reduce carbon emissions to, for the survival of all living things. And so, this is the urgency that calls climate girls to action. 
we um, if you go to world clock or this is zero hour, you can see a clock that's just running all of the time, counting down how much time we have left to turn this around. And so anyway, we against that constant reminder, we're seeing a rise in girls leading in the justice, climate justice movement and other social movements. But before we can tell you about climate girl, we got to tell you about Malala. Okay, how many of you know who Malala Yousafzai is? Okay, mm -hmm. great, awesome. Uh, so just as some context, in 2012, Malala was shot in the head by the, by the Taliban while she was going to school. Um, there's a lot of media attention on Malala's recovery and her story, um, mostly from Western media sources that saw Malala as a symbol of the movement for girls' education in the Arab world, where girls couldn't go to school. So after her miraculous recovery, uh, Malala became an outspoken activist for girls' rights, and she eventually won the Nobel Peace Prize. So while of course we support and revere what Malala is doing, some people have identified what they call the Malala effect. Um, and this is sort of where we drew inspiration for our work. Uh, the idea is that media mostly focus on her as spectacular and unique. Um, she single-handedly is trying to solve the world's problems uh, related to girls' inequality. Um, but in the process, by focusing solely on Malala, we, we kind of, the other people disappear, right? The other girls who are also working towards equality or even the girls who are still continuing to be victims of violence in the Arab world or other places around the world, <laughs> everywhere really. Um, uh, so, uh, anyway, the, we kind of, we forget about them, right? And Malala rides to the top as exceptional and spectacular. So this past decade has seen the rise of spectacular climate girls, right? Um, we've seen the rise of other spectacular girls, like X Gonzalez, who became pretty much the spokesperson for uh, the March for Our Lives movement after the Park Parkland shooting. Um, the same sort of dynamic happened with her as well. She became the voice of her generation, right, when it came about gun rights and gun activism. So we focused on climate girls like Greta, and Thunberg and Jamie Margolin and Autumn Peltier because these girls are on the covers of magazines. They're winning awards. They're invited to speak uh, at global, important global forums. Unfortunately, many media stories and many world leaders dismiss these girls as angry or hysterical and that they are uninformed on climate science. Yet, these girls are informed. <laughs> They're informed about this. Science, they're following the reports coming out of the COP, which is why they want you to panic and act as if your house is on fire. Mainstream media are fascinated by what climate girls are wearing, what they're eating, what their families are like, how they manage even to go to school when they're organizing climate strikes from their bedrooms. They're pretending that they're having their periods so that they can finish a grant application, start a nonprofit, or even sue a government. And then there are girls who aren't even able to go to school to strike. So they face a different challenge too. So that we found as we analyze these climate girls, they're all working in really different ways in different contexts, which is great because it offers so many different ways for youth to enter into the climate justice movement. We also found a common trajectory in their stories. So first they start pretty young. I mean, here's some examples eight years old, seven years old, nine years old, 10. I mean, that's what, second grade, third grade? I mean, that's pretty young if you know any second and third graders, right? <laughs> and, and so, um, all right, so, the, so they're young, they're starting in. And we, they also became involved in climate activism from personal experience, such as researching polar bears for a science project and realizing that they're on a path that will end in extinction. Or, or learning how the meat industry contributes to climate change and then they become vegans or vegetarians. Or witnessing massive amounts of plastic washing up on their shores of their islands. Or experiencing wildflowers when they can't go outside all summer. Or having to fight oil pipelines threatening their water and their land. 
or images of dead birds with plastic bags in their stomachs. Or cell phone footage of devastation from floods that remind them of people on the front lines of the climate crisis. And through all of these, <laughs> and through all of this, they're also very aware of the lack of action from politicians. So as Heather was talking about, we see this clock ticking down the, on zero hour, for example, and they really become anxious and enraged that people are not paying attention and not doing something to protect their future. So these are just some of the realities that inspire climate girls to take to the streets, lobby politicians, sue governments, start nonprofits, and design video games to make a difference in any way that they can. So we're not gonna get all to all of those ideas uh, tonight, but we're gonna just give you a little bit of a highlight reel of some of the things we found from our case studies. So we started with Greta, and uh, what we see about her is she's an iconic protagonist, which is made possible through her social media use. So let's break this down. An icon is someone who's recognizable. So I'm thinking Wonder Woman's an icon. Uh, President Obama, President Trump is an icon. Britney Spears. Any icons out there you can think of? No. <laughs> Maybe in the Zoom first, there's some, some ideas out there. <laughs> so she's iconic. Uh, Greta is iconic because her image is identifiable and her image becomes replicated and used in several different ways that we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, she's also what we're calling an icon iconic protagonist because a protagonist is someone that you root for. Um, can you think of any iconic protagonists that are also activists? The Pope? The Pope. Yeah, yeah, that's like yeah, actually really good. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, there's not a lot of them, uh, but I love that example of the Pope. Um, but this is why we're interested in Greta. So Greta has risen as an iconic protagonist because her climate activism becomes a gripping drama, right? She takes on world leaders and big business very publicly, and she do documents this through her social media. And she's also what we would call an intersectional feminist icon, iconic protagonist, because her actions and norm, her actions don't seem to fit with traditional norms of what a girl is supposed to be like. Um, she continues to advance the scientific arguments and continues to keep them on the public agenda, despite main, mainstream media pretty much trying to dismiss her. So, iconic protagonists. Uh, inspire audiences to participate in the drama, and our social media platforms give us the ability to follow uh, and to co-perform with her. It's like we're part of her drama that she's taking on all these big business leaders. Um, and, she, uh, and can she continues to document through the social media. Has anyone, does anyone here follow Greta on social media? A couple of people. So what, what do you notice about the way she uses social media? Someone from this side. <laughs> Someone from over here. I think it's going to have to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that sometimes her social media is quite angry mm -hmm. um, and that she uses it all to talk about her climate tricks. Okay, so social media is angry and she uses it to post about climate tricks strikes from school. And I'm repeating that, of course, for the Zoom audience. What about in this in this middle part here? Yeah. She talks to other people, like if someone calls her out for something, she will always have a again. Yeah, she, uh, did you say call them out? Yeah. yeah, she calls out people who attack her. Yeah, and she's pretty ironic in the way that she does it. She takes on this uh, very publicly. So here are just some ways in which she's changed her Twitter profiles uh, to respond to people who, primarily male uh, politicians, who are criticizing her. So uh, here she changed her on the 
left-hand side, uh, she changed her Twitter profile to say she's a teenager working on her anger management. This is after Trump really tweeted out that she was just very angry and needs to chill and go see a movie. So she, she takes that on in her identity. Uh, on the top right left-hand side, it says a kind but poorly informed teenager. So Piers Morgan, who's a news commentator, uh, basically said, you know, she's just, you know, she seems like a nice person, but she just really doesn't know what she's talking about. And then most recently, Boris Johnson called her a bunny hugger and she changed her Twitter profile to be a bunny, buttery, bunny hugger. <laughs> so because of this, we see that people are really remixing and participating her with her. So as, again, we talked about her as an iconic protagonist. So social media allows people to um, do things like memes, mashups, uh, and really spread her image and become part of the performance with her. So you might remember this from the angry UN speech. This was an image that went viral. I think some people are questioning whether this it actually happened or not. Uh, but it's something that went viral and really took off online. Uh, and then another thing we wanted to share with you is um, this mashup between her UN speech and de a death metal song. So we're going to play it. It's a little loud, so I'll warn you guys here right now. But it's supposed to be. It's death metal. <laughs> What's your message to world leaders today? Um. My message is that we will be watching you. This is all gone. I should be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet, you all can toss your people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams, my childhood, with your empty words, and yet I'm one of the lucky ones. That's just a taste of, of what that's about. But also in her social media, she tries to, I, I agree with what Merle was saying, she does post angry things, and she does post different um, ideas, but she also shows up to where people are doing the actual work of the climate justice movement. And her goal is to really shine a light on them and away from her. So one of the things that a lot of our, these climate girls that we've studied are doing is using their platforms to make a difference and to show where the work is and, what the, and to keep focus on it. So one criticism of the climate justice movement is the outside attention given to white girls. Uh, what we found in our research is that girls are very aware of their power and privilege um, and they use their platforms, like I just mentioned, to uh, show up because what they're saying and what they believe and live is that there is no climate justice without social justice. So they constantly also have to push against the stereotypes of girls, right? Catty, superficial, backstabbing, compliant. And in this picture of Greta and Malala, we see that they support each other's causes, they're coalitional in their work, and they are working together for a collective future. So now that we have told you a little bit about the Greta effect, we'll tell you a little bit about Little Miss Flint or Mari Hopani. She brought national attention to the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. Jonathan was super helpful with that. Um, but I don't know if you know, but this Flint, um, Flint's water crisis it's the definition of evil to me. I mean, the, the city diverted the water supply from healthy drinking water to polluted drinking water in without any public comment, without any election, without any information. So can you imagine, like you're just drinking your water and all of a sudden people are getting sick. You don't know why. You start to like, hey, what's going on? All right, so it's just incredible to me. They had to figure it out and the harm that came from that. So little Miss Flint, she's a pageant girl, and she wrote a letter to President Obama. She was eight years old, and she, um, she was telling him about the poisoning uh, of her community. And he answered by coming to Flint and gave her a big hug. 
and he declared Flint a national emergency in 2008. Recently, some justice has been served, but the damage is ongoing and the long term health, term health effects remain. So the Flint Girl shows us a different kind of climate girl activism that successfully merges public criticism about environmental racism while also um, let's see while also creating an activist and influencer brand. So she integrates commodity activism and caring for her local community. The commodity activism means that your activism doesn't reject consumerism, right? You can support the environment through your purchasing power or participate in resistance through purchasing. So some of her criticism or the way that she is uh, becoming a climate girl is through her criticism of popular culture. So in this one, there's a picture of her uh, and it says, no one cares about the Kardashian, just give us clean water. So she's always reminding the public of Flint and what happened to Flint uh, and why it's important. Uh, so she becomes, you know, she's just trying to be a teenager, but she inserts herself uh, through her social media use. Um, she actually is also a brand ambassador for Gap. Gap has a new campaign that's trying to, to bring young activists and young leaders um, to support the environment and sustainable fashion. Uh, so she's involved in that. She has an activist Barbie doll uh, that she encourages girls like her to uh, be proud of being activists, right? She stands up, kids' voices matter. Mari's climate activism is global through her water filters and her recent seat at the table of the Global Climate Summit. But she's also local at the same time. So she takes care of Flint kids generally. She uses her social media following to bring resources like um, backpacks full of school supplies. She has a, a Christmas toy drives and Easter basket drives. And she asks her social media followers to write letters to Flint kids to empower them and let them know that the world cares about their health and the future. But through all of her activism, she's always bringing it back to Flint, right? So she's reminding us uh, how long it's been since Flint has had uh, clean water. And I just love these images because we're seeing how she's aging on social media, but yet she's continuing her um, public activism, her public presence. Hey. Okay. Oh, no, not yet. Oh, it's okay. Really? Yeah. It's so good though. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna switch over to the indigenous girl effect. So I'll let you I'll let you read this quote on the screen about biodiversity. So so the indigenous girl effect and this okay, it was Autumn Peltier. Okay. So this is a is a picture that is now maybe becoming familiar, right? You have you have a girl, global sage, world leader, young. All right. Um, she was supposed to. She's her name is Autumn. She's from Wickham Wickham First Nation, and she was to present a traditional copper water bowl to um, Canada's prime minister at a First Nations assembly. Um, when she and she wasn't supposed to speak, but she broke down in tears, and she and she did speak, and she asked him. Um, she well, she didn't ask him anything. She told him that she was unhappy with his choices. Right? She's she's eight. Um, and he said that he understood, and that he promised her he would protect the water. So just like Greta and Mari, Autumn rose to fame. She was invited to world stages. Uh, she began to be bullied. Uh, she was given a variety of awards and she's still fighting for clean water and equitable access. She also just signed on with Abercrombie to support clean water in clothing production processes and operations. Now this is Tokata Iron Eyes from Lakota, she's Lakota Sioux. And she was instrumental in bringing national and international attention to Standing Rock in 2016, 
Does anybody, how many people remember that? Okay. <laughs> um, so this was a protest against the Dakota Access Pipeline. There's a current protest going on right now against Line 3. How many people know about that? Sure. People are out there, water protectors protecting our water. So this video tells a lot, but also notice some of the things that we've been talking about. When I do a match champion, I'm Bentu Washington. Hi, my name is Tokata and I'm nine years old. The Black Hills is very important and sacred to me and the Lakota people. It is very beautiful and we go to the to pray. And I love it there. My name is Tokata Iron Eyes. I am 12 years old. I live in Fort Yates, North Dakota. As Native Americans, we do have a very close connection with Mother Earth because she's the one that provides for us and nurtures us. And that's why we're here. We're making history right now. This is a historical moment that people are going to remember for the rest of their lives. The pipeline was initially supposed to be built in Bismarck, North Dakota. And those people said, no, we don't want this pipeline because it's going to ruin our water. So then they moved it down here to the reservation. Since we're downstream, it'll hit us right away. This is impacting me. This is impacting my life. We're only here today to protect this land because our ancestors, they fought for this land. I want everyone to know that this isn't just for us. This is a wake up call to everyone. Everything needs water to live. When it's not your problem, when it's not so close to you, you don't feel as obligated to do something about it. But if you talk to the people who are close to that issue, then you can connect. And I think that's really what changed. We can switch to renewable energy. We can do things to help Mother Earth, the one that provides for us. We can do things to help her, but we choose not to. So if you can just look around and think about all the things that you can do to help, it would help Mother Earth and she would be built back up. At the beginning of being an activist, I was thinking about the near future. I was thinking about the risk that it was gonna take when there were rubber bullets flying at me and my family members. Now it's come to this point in my life where I'm thinking about if I'm going to have a kid, if I'm going to have a daughter, what is that going to look like for her? And so to be able to say that I get to be a part of a group who offers a good future for that child, it means that my children get to have a safe future. It means that I get to see grandchildren. Climate change is a big threat and it's bigger now than ever. And so we are the solution. We need to be following the indigenous peoples who know how to live in peace and harmony with the earth. Now we get to stand up to the oil companies who came here and desecrated our land and show them we know how to live and we're gonna prosper without you. So you'll notice that, she, that, she, that her argument evolves as she ages. Um, and how she's been in the public eye for some time. So Takata also resisted the water, the pipe, the, the pipeline project through her social media campaign that she designed called Respect Our Water, or that she and others designed. And also through, um, they organized as part of that protest a 500 mile relay to carry a letter to the Army Corps of Engineers. And Takata and Greta have worked together to testify before uh, Congress in DC. And uh, Takata actually invited Greta to her nation to discuss the climate crisis, where they spoke about their intentional need to work together uh, and resist cultural pressure to be jealous and submit to infighting, which is some of the stereotypes we were talking about about girls and what they're like. Um, Takata is also excited to be a Marvel superhero. Um, she is, she, uh, Disney had created her, uh, and she is the teller of the truest tales. So they created a whole story and, about her as a superhero, uh, and uh, she tells us in an interview, I think the real message is really Indigenous people and young people's stories are so important that they need to be told. They are so instrumental to building a world everybody would want to live in. So the, her superpower is storytelling. So anyway, she and many other climate activists managed to be both critical through their social media uh, views, 
but they're also mainstream at the same time, right? They're working with companies like Abercrombie and Gap uh, and Disney. Uh, so we see that kind of attention there. Uh, we don't judge it, but we we recognize it. <laughs> and uh, so as Na Native American and First Nations people are stereotyped, which is a challenge, um, as people of the past. So Crystal Echohawk from Pawnee Nation says, white supremacy has deliberately attempted to erase Native peoples from the past and make them invisible today. And the constant decolonial work to tell their past and present stories and to be presently perceived is what white earth Ojibwe scholar Gerald Bisner terms survivance, wherein narratives incorporate themes of survival and resistance that include a Native presence. So Indigenous girls' activism is important as survivance. And you notice here on Dakota's face that handprint is the symbol for hashtag missing and murdered indigenous women. How many people have heard of that? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, so as she's a climate activist, she's also raising awareness about the femicide crisis in North America, where indigenous women and girls are being murdered and going missing, which is a present reality. Their bodies are on the line. So as indigenous climate activists protest big oil and fight for their land, their culture, and clean water. They're fighting the construction of oil pipelines in very remote areas, um, which threaten their physical safety in a different way than we've seen with some of the other high profile climate girls. Um, so you can learn more about this by looking up land camps on uh, sites such as honorearth.org. The last thing we want to highlight is techno feminist activism. Okay. This is kind of a switch. <laughs> so um, techno-feminism shows us how gender influences uh, technological design and innovation. So for example, the reason we're showing you a minivan is because the first minivan was actually designed by an all-women engineer team. Uh, and that was significant because it had uh, elements embedded in its design that were more friendly and um, useful to a family than a station, station magnet. Uh, so that was just one example of how we see techno-feminism. Another example is kind of right there. Um, <clears throat> car airbags were originally designed based on an adult male body. Um, and we've seen that several uh, people who are outside of that norm <laughs> actually face a lot of injuries because of the design of the airbag, which has, was kind of universal to go on cars. So here, um, the yellow is a little striking on your face. But um, you can see the ways in which women are more likely to be injured versus men based on the design of the car airbag. Um, so it's kind of, it's research like this and drawing attention to how biases are embedded in technological design that we see that we need more diversity in the sources of innovation. Uh, we were talking about STEM earlier. Um, we do see that when we have more diverse people designing things, we have better, things are better, right? We, we solve problems better. So many of the climate girl activists that we're studying are using technology in really different and innovative ways. Uh, so we wanted to, uh, to highlight some of them for, for you. So this is a cool project. Um, this project comes from an organization called Kids Against Plastic Bags, which was started by two teen girls, uh, Emma and Ella Meek. Uh, they're in England. And they designed this app. Uh, where kids can actually track their litter pickups. And their, uh, their litter pickups are loaded onto this map. Uh, you can see how many uh, straws they picked up, how many plastic bottles. And then on the other side, you see kind of this graph that's showing how, how youth are participating and making a difference. And um, we're both uh, media studies scholars. And it's just interesting that this kind, those images we showed you at the beginning with the emaciated polar bears and all this death and destruction, um, there's a lot of research that says that doesn't actually necessarily propel people to act. They want to see solutions. They want to be solution-based. And so I think the girls that we're studying are really looking at that and saying, how can we make this uh, into a reality? So the other cool thing about Kids Against Plastic Bags, they have a ton of technological uh, strategies. This next one is called it's a hashtag activism campaign called Pack It In. 
So what you do is you collect your trash and then you sort it into packets based on the company. So you see potato chips and you see Snickers bars. They provide the addresses for you to actually send this packaging back to the company and tell them <laughs> to use more sustainable, uh, more sustainable packaging. And they also show you how to write a polite letter. So I thought that was really cute. Okay. They're really interested in being polite in this kind of activism that they're doing. And then there's Bye Bye Plastic Bags, started by these sisters, Melody and Isabel, Isabel Weissen, which aims to get Indonesia to ban plastic bags, and they're winning this fight. And they're also teaching indigenous women in Bali to make reusable plastic bags and sell them to reduce plastic pollution, and also achieve some economic stability. And we were impressed with how innovative girls from the global STEM program called Technovation work. They created apps to respond to a very local environmental problems that they faced. So we looked at all the different projects that these girls were, were building and doing. Uh, there was one app that tracks how much water you're using in the shower, so you can be aware of your water usage and, and cut down on that. Uh, one app helps people search for recycling centers in their community. And then it also teaches you how to sort your trash so you can participate in like the right kind of recycling as opposed to what a lot of people do is just throw things in the trash that they think are recyclable. Um, and the girl designers of that app said, pollution is our doom, or it certainly can be, right? So they have this really positive way that they're trying to use technology to get people to raise awareness and participate. Another app that is really cool is, <laughs> these girls are really innovative and, and interesting. So this one is called Box In, and it's a mobile app designed to deal with reality brought on by e-commerce, right? And we've seen during the pandemic that people are now changing their shopping behaviors to have everything delivered, right? And those shopping behaviors might even continue. Um, but it also leads to a lot of waste uh, that I think is unseen in a lot of ways. So this app actually uh, matches people who need cardboard boxes. So if you need a cardboard box, you could use this app and say, and people could say, I got, I got my Nest Cafe delivered. So the girl designers say, our app is boxed in. It's environmentally friendly. With the, with the use of boxed in, none of your boxes go to the landfill again, and you never need to buy a cardboard box again. <laughs> Another thing that we found in our research is that girls are using designing video games to actually address the climate crisis too. Uh, and Brian had mentioned that I have um, done some research on video games and it's really interesting the ways in which the medium of the video game can engage people in a different way than say a movie or a documentary. Um, you can participate, you can be immersed. Uh, and so it becomes a medium that can be a really useful thing for people to think about how they might change behavior or how they might um, what might happen if they don't change behavior, right? Simulations. So Girls Who Code is a great organization that teaches video game design. Uh, and I wanted to tell you about this kind of cool video game. And this one is called uh, Plastic Pollution. So in Plastic Pollution, it opens with a cartoon turtle who's named Lily. And Lily tells us she had a really bad life because she's been separated from her mom. And she was reunited with her mom. She got so happy, she jumped up and a plastic straw got cut, cut, caught in her nose. So uh, the whole game is about cleaning up plastic pollution in the ocean so that Lily and her mom can have a really nice life. Uh, I'll just tell you a couple more before we go on. Uh, another video game is called What They Don't See. Uh, and this one was really innovative. Uh, because it allows players to scour the earth to create uh, to to collect kelp for alternative energy product, projects. So, what I I think what we found uh, when we were looking at this techno feminism is that research on how to increase gender equality in STEM suggests that girls want to use their technical skills to make a difference. They don't want to learn coding for coding's sake. They want to see what they can do, do project based learning, or how they can make a difference. Um, and this really uh, come, becomes true when you listen or um, talk to girls who are doing these kinds of projects. So in this one, um, Dakota, who designed this, this game here, is called Ecoverse. And the whole video game is about creating a biodiverse environment. 
Um, so you get to pick and choose and, and go through the whole maze to, to get those elements. And she says, games today have the ideas of destruction and tearing things down. I think that influences the kind of decisions we make and how we live our lives. So, so again, it's just another way that we're seeing how technology becomes an active um, solution for some girls in the climate justice movement. So now we come to our conclusion. The climate girl effect is many things. They show up and support each other and they use their platforms to draw attention to those who are most affected. And at the same time, they have to work to keep themselves united as a movement as culture really wants to divide them. Um, from our interviews with girls, they tell us that they want the dominant media narratives to shift and they also would like to just be kids. Yeah, they. Uh, I, I think we hear this, and and when they're talking to media, where they're, uh, you know, doing interviews, they say, I, you know, I don't want to do this work. That, that's a lot with Greta was saying in the speech we showed you at the beginning. Um, they just want to be kids. They want to go to school, but instead, they're feeling very pressure and a lot of anxiety about how to move forward and if they're even going to have a future. So that propels them to be a part of this activist movement. <clears throat> so we thought we would read a, a quote from every. Avery McRae, who we were able to interview, she's suing the US government because it's threatening her future. Uh, so she's part of what they're calling the kids climate, uh, climate case. Um, and here's what she says. Um, for me, I feel like there's also a lot of like almost condescending media coverage, almost kind of framing the story as you fight government, right? It's weird to put an emphasis on the youth part in my opinion, because it feels kind of demeaning. It creates this underdog sort of feel. And it's like, I'm not necessarily the underdog. And she also said, I'm, I very quickly learned that I do not need to be accepted by everyone and I do not need any validation from adults who aren't gonna do anything anyway. And that was definitely like a weird thing for a 10 year old to learn. Because you kind of grow up with this mentality of adults know everything and they're the ones who support you. And they're the ones who are going to help you. And that was quickly ripped away from me. And I was like, oh, that's not true. Like, I'm very much in this with the people who are actually going to support me. So from previous research on climate, uh, youth climate activism, we learned of this category called dangerous dissent, which a lot of these girls are advocating for. Uh, the danger is in the scope of the change needed. Dangerous decenters see the need to uproot the whole entire system. The system that created the problem is not going to be the system that's going to solve the problem. So as Greta says, we are at the beginning of the mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales and internal economic growth. Yet these girls are hopeful, right? Because we know this from this ego anxiety. It's it's a rough place to be feeling that anxiety. And so the solution for them is to act. So we wanted to so we wanted to play a clip of Jamie Margolin, uh, who started this is this is zero hour um, as she's talking to uh, during this Lakota law um, and uh, interview. And she's really uh, talking about the heart of what she sees as some of the problems. So it's a longer clip, but we thought it was worth showing. Okay, we're doing another one of these protecting water discussions um, and we're just going to wait for a couple of people to pop on and then we're going to uh, have a discussion about different ways that we can do what we can where we are. We're just going to wait for a few more people to pop on before we get the discussion started. Hello. Hi. Exactly. Hi, how are you? What are waiting for? I am super well. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Will you introduce yourself for the yes. people that may not be familiar with you? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Sedai Margolin. I'm 19 years old. I'm a climate justice organizer. I started in this movement when I was 14 years old. Um, I co-founded the international youth climate justice organization called Zero Hour, which um, because we have zero hours left to act on the climate crisis and zero hour organized youth climate marches on 
in the summer of 2018 all around the world um, that laid the groundwork for um, and kind of helped be like a, a domino effect essentially for the current Fridays for Future and school strike for climate movement. So we were the, the, the precursor to that. And then ever since then, Zero Hour has been continuing to mobilize and organize and have different um, lobby days, summits, just mobilizing around youth climate action, intergenerational climate action and intersectional climate action. Um, understanding that this climate crisis is inseparable from all other social issues. I'm also an author. I um, published a book called Youth to Power, Your Voice and How to Use It, which is a guide to being a young organizer for any cause. Um, because I would get a lot of people asking me like, hey, like, how do you take action? I really want to help. I really want to, like, I'm terrified by the climate crisis. How do I help out? I really want to help. And I, I would keep responding to people individually and I would be happy to do so. But then I was like, there seems to be a demand for information here. Um, and maybe I should consolidate this in an easy and accessible way. And so that's what Youth to Power is. And it's a book and it's out everywhere. Um, and I'm also an artist and a, a film student. Um, you can get the book on any, someone said, where can you get the book? Any social, what was saying social media? Any place that books are sold, just Youth to Power, anywhere books are sold. But anyway. You can also like make a post about that later on uh, today so that people have access to that as a resource because I think people are getting like super either overwhelmed or frustrated, right? So uh, offering solutions and accessible solutions are gonna be pretty, that's gonna be pretty key. Yeah, and that's that's why I'm I'm happy to talk to you here today because as like I said, as someone who's been in this movement for a while, as a young person, as a teenager, um, climate anxiety can be overwhelming. And with the IPCC report that just came out, a lot of people who maybe weren't tuned into the climate crisis before or were tuned in but were like, a lot of people are tuned in, but then you get a reminder and then it's like, oh God, we're that screwed, you know, like they're that kind of reminder of like it's actually code red has really shaken a lot of people and some people respond to that with um motivation some people respond to that with there's a certain level like mm -hmm. i feel like destruction that we can kind of mentally comprehend before we start shutting down and a lot of people in response to the IPCC report, I've seen a lot of this discourse on Twitter and things like that, where it's like, wow, we're screwed. Time to like throw in the towel and party it up while the world ends. And that's why I'm here with you to talk about line three to say, well, actually that's not, climate defeatism is not helpful. And it is definitely not helpful to the people on the front lines who are putting their bodies on the line every day to protect what we have left. And I think it, the earth will always be worth fighting for. And so instead of falling into defeat, it's good to draw people's attention who aren't already plugged in to line three and how they can help instead of just falling into that nothing matters kind of dangerous mindset. Yeah, it is a really dangerous mindset because it, it sometimes takes on its own. Okay. And so that's the conclusion of our talk. <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. Sorry, especially people that don't back home. Hi, right, all right, so we've got plenty of time for discussion. Um, so I'm going to start with people here, and uh, Laurel's going to come around with a microphone. And then what we'll probably do is repeat the question so that uh, it kind of gets through the, the microphone up here for the folks who are at home. So if you have a question for our speakers, please just raise your hand, and Laurel will bring you. The mic is not scary, I promise. If you could introduce yourself if you're willing. Yeah, my name is Kevin. Um, my question uh, pertains to one of the thoughts of these young activists when they say, we hope that mainstream media is changing. My question for you two is, do you feel like that's happening now? Uh, we'll say po in our post-pandemic culture where you have this um, awakening and mainstream media is realizing for their need to change. Do you feel is that, if so, that's the case? And um, still us in on your thoughts. I need to repeat that concisely. Yeah. <laughs> <Can> you, <laughs> how would you repeat that question concisely? 
So you're you're assuming that maybe the pandemic made media more responsible. Right. <laughs> and so what's our take on that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh so the activism stuff. Yeah, I, I guess I'm not see we're not seeing that in what we looked at in terms of a shift, a remarkable shift because of COVID. I mean, it's still a profit-driven mainstream media is pretty profit-driven industry, right? So you do well, there is some there is some good reporting out of alternative sources like uh, Unicorn Riot is doing a great job, and Truth Out I think is doing a pretty good job. I can't think of others. Yeah, and just in terms of um, documenting what these climate girls are doing, their message is really disappearing, and it's more about the spectacularism that we were talking about. So. You know, when we saw when we saw Jamie Margolin in her bedroom, you know, it's like that was a New York Times magazine article saying, what are what are these climate girls doing? What are they eating? Who are they listening to? You know, who are they following? And yet, so Jamie Margolin needs to go to alternative sources to get her message. And through the pandemic, actually, um, it's been interesting because they found actually even more technological ways for them to get their message across. So I think they've been able to actually bring more people into the movement because they're doing online webinars, right? Because they're, you know, doing online strikes. And this is a way that I think they're moving forward um, together. So, I mean, one thing I would like to say related to that is the concept of agenda setting. So the thing with Greta is that she continues to set the agenda, right? So she continues to say, look, I don't really care about what you're talking about. <laughs> like, let's talk about the science, let's do this. And so I think that is having a trickle down effect to a certain degree, uh, but is that what sells newspapers? I mean, one of the problems is, you know, our, you know, money driven media society. So that's why things like social media, which isn't filtered, well, kind of filtered, but that's a whole other conversation, but where they can actually get their agenda and ideas out uh, through social media. So, so it's kind of a mixed bag, I guess I would say, but, but one we need to continue to talk about because the girls themselves recognize it. Um, they continue to talk to media, give interviews, because they see that that's important. Um, but unfortunately, they're not actually reporting on the message that they have. Other questions, and then we can also invite our friends on Zoom to join us. Other questions? Um, my name is CJ. I was just wondering, why do you think it is specifically these young girls as opposed to boys that are feeling this, this pressure and this responsibility to do something? I'm so glad you asked that question because that was the question I was going to ask if you didn't. So I'm so glad that you did. So CJ's question was, was why young girls or is it young girls more than boys? I'm not sure. I don't want to try and misgrade your question, but it does. That's been agreed to me as well. Is it? There's something different going on. Um, I'm curious to get your view. Well, I'll start and say, well, we were just looking at these climate girls. So there wasn't a lot of where are the boys uh, conversations or, uh, you know, I know I'm speaking in binaries, but uh, there, we, we don't know. I don't know. You, maybe you have some ideas. Well, I think um, girls are in general socialized to be more caring, more kind, the connection with the earth. Uh, and so I think that becomes a natural fit. I mean, one of the things we've seen with uh, when we were doing research on girls who are starting nonprofit organizations, we know that women are more, it's a women dominated field working in nonprofits because it's a caring profession. It's a it's a healing profession. Um, we don't want to, of course, essentialize that in terms of gender and and sex, but uh, we do see that uh, many girls do gravitate towards that. And if we look historically about women and their relationship to the environmental justice movement, we see a lot of women are um, leaders in the movement as well. But this is definitely a different kind of uh, thing, which is why we're so interested in it because, again, they're so young and they're raising their voices uh, at age eight, you know, I mean, like I can't imagine what that must be like as, as a challenge. So thank you for the question. Do you know of any sociological evidence just looking at the numbers of 
people by by sex in terms of participation in, in climate activism? No, I don't know that, but I will say that there is research out there um, that's looking at why youth in general become activists and why they're in, interested in the climate justice movement. Uh, so there are male perspectives out there and boy perspectives as well. Or Sorry to be binary, but do you know, I mean, from that perspective, but uh, I think the idea is that it's, um, people are freaking out. These kids are freaking out and they, they need to feel like they're making a difference. And if you look at the, um, at the broad youth involved in climate justice activism, it's, it, there's, it's all kinds of people. So, so it's a very welcoming thing to participate in. It's just that, a lot of climate activist girls are are high profile. Yes. You guys talked about uh, the climate girls having to seek alternative, I guess, outlets for their for their message through various online, I assume, like social media. And and given the fact that in you know, kind of like the last president presidential election there was a lot of alternative facts so does that you know, does that cast a negative is a negative feel towards what they're trying to get across are they being portrayed as also choosing alternative facts to the facts that the mainstream media is negative for them can you really fight that if it is yeah, so the, the question is uh, how maybe is misinformation operating on social media, um, even though they're using, these climate girls are using social media, are they also kind of victim of misinformation as they're engaging with this? There's some really interesting research out there, um, especially related to Greta, because, uh, you know, she's been so, so high profile and she uses social media a lot. And so there's been some conspiracy theories about her that kind of float around. Uh, one of which is that she's actually really an old woman. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a weird conspiracy theory, uh, but there's some interesting photos of her uh, floating around. And, uh, but anyway, there's also a lot of misinformation about climate change in general floating around in um, the social media world. I know uh, Wikipedia has to really monitor the kinds of information that's coming across uh, on the Wikipedia pages be about climate change because people are constantly trying. It's a constant battle, right? So I, I recently did a talk about um, fake news and misinformation, and we were, we were, you know, having a nice conversation, a little bit of a debate about, anyway, um, citizen journalists. Like, what's it like to actually have people who are not trained in the field of journalism to contribute to um, documenting these kinds of things? and um, that person was on the side of people need to be trained to be able to do this so that we can sift through and find our sources. So, and I guess, you know, they've got the science on their side and there's such a, um, there's, it, it's so verifiable. And as they say, like, we know the solutions, like we don't have to talk about this anymore. We just really need to do, to act. It looks like we have a question online. And I'm going to see if this is going to work. So Kathleen Callum at home has a question. Uh, Kathleen, why don't you try and unmute yourself and let's see if that works. So there you go. Go for it. So most of the most of the conversation is about um, most of the conversation and fear revolves uh, around um, our capacity for. Um, hamstringing unlimited growth on a and on a finite planet so we're the adults in the room um yeah. when do we when do we focus um on an explicit conversation about um we have to put ecosystem services first when do we focus on getting business departments on campus on board with teaching alternative economy? Yeah, <laughs> that's what they're saying. <laughs> that's what these girls are saying. They're like adults, we don't have the power. Well, we, we have power, um, but you are the people who have more power than us and you're not using it um, responsibly. 
Uh, and I think that's what's so frustrating. Uh, we, we use that quote from Avery, who's you know in the kids' climate um, uh, lawsuit. Uh, and she does feel empowered to be able to sue the government for not protecting her rights uh, to, to a future. Uh, but we're, we're not seeing that. Oh, sorry. And interesting about that is that it's the, the suing is about inaction. So, so the time to be acting is now to um, Kathleen online, right? So now, now we have to do, it's, it has to be now. <laughs> and I think one of the takeaways perhaps for us is how adults can be allies for these youth. Um, for, for, uh, for a planet. For, for, for the planet. planet. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I, get, I, get uh, I, I think we want to, I mean, one of our goals was to amplify their voices uh, and to see how we can walk alongside of them because uh, they face a very different reality uh, based on their age and the way they are in, in the world right now. Um, so we don't have the answers. <laughs> but they do. Thank you, Kathleen. That worked out really well from <laughs> home. So if other people at home have a question, feel free uh, to raise your hand digitally or put something in the chat and um, I can read out the question. Uh, but I think we have another one in the audience here. Uh, John, please. Hi. I, I'll try to be quick with this, I think. So I'm curious if how they, if they, these activists that you're looking at, navigate how they use being a kid or a girl differently. Because on one hand, they seem to be like, I just want to be a kid and do kid things. And on the other hand, you're actively choosing not to. And um, and then on the other hand, they're also saying like, you should respect us as an adult and you should take us seriously just like you take anyone else here. So there's like this back and forth between like, when do I want to be a kid, when do I don't? And then they're also selling their image to be a Barbie doll, which suggests, well, this is what kids do because you're going to play with a Barbie doll that's going to, you know, like does these things. So there's this, and I don't think these things are necessarily bad, but I'm curious if they navigate those in any way. And I guess another would be like, they actually have a full lot of power in terms of like the kid market and toy stuff, you know, it's like they could persuade all their peers to be like, just stop buying this stuff. I think corporate America would take them very seriously, right? So that's another sort of power they do have. So there's just like these sort of weird plays between where they're a kid and where they're not, and whether they, do they address that? How do they navigate that? So to try to rephrase that for everybody on Zoom is the question in part whether they're, I don't want to put words in your mouth, not playing both sides, but they're here, they're an adult, there, they're a child, um, or it's here, here they're, they're worried about their image, there, they're selling their image, uh, something like that. that you, you put it better. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that we didn't get into is exactly that piece of like, how do you invite people in to be intergenerational and be part of doing the work at the same time that you're like, wake up and shake, shaking them and saying, you know, how do I get your attention in a way that's going to be helpful? And it, they're trying all the rhetorical strategies. So, so there's a, um, some research on, it's called a feedback rhetorics. And it's like the rhetoric of when do you use that you're a kid to get change, to, to get people to pay attention, to make the change that's needed. And so that's just a whole different section, but also interesting and a little bit of an aside is that there's a chapter on nonprofits because we were interested like when girls start these nonprofits as climate activists, what kinds of power structures do they build? And it's, it's fascinating, they're different. Uh, and they're non-hierarchical and they're, they just have different strategies, which are, which you can read about if you're interested in. But um, in terms of the consumerism, that's, that's the sort of the diversity of all the different kinds of climate activists, because it, that's right. It's like, how do you, how do you get out of a capitalist, consumerist system? Some are like, I reject your awards. I reject all of this, this path, um, because like just fix, can we just fix this problem? Like, but I, I, I agree, <laughs> uh, but it is, it's a rhetorical strategy I think that they use. Um, I don't know how, 
you know, that as they age, I think they seem, we see how they get more um, sophisticated in their arguments. But that idea, like, I'm just a kid, I don't want to do this. Like, I'm going to go do something else. I want to play with my friends. I think that resonates with people. And it's something that, um, you know, puts it, 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 it gets adults to say, yeah, you're right. That's, that's weird. But I think Greta just turned 18. And, and she was saying, okay, well, because I'm 18, you know, <laughs> I'm not really just an adult right now, but, you know, so it's kind of a weird thing. It's a social construction and, it's, and it changes in different cultures and different times. And the other thing that we didn't really get into too much is that they, they're bullied, right? And so <laughs> it's like, I'm just a kid. And then there, there's a whole host of things that come with being a high profile social media, cyber. I mean, it's just, it's kind of, it gets pretty yucky. We have time for Long one more question. I'm going to invite Olivia, uh, who's uh, at home. Olivia, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, feel free. Hi. So I was wondering, like speaking towards intersectionality, how do you feel race and class play into the climate change movement? And do you feel that like these attributes play into the politics politics of climate change? Yes. Um, so one of the things that we just are becoming brutally aware of is, I think somebody said it at, I think Laurel actually said this at the, um, at the forum recently, those who are impacted first are impacted the worst. And so we see in places where um, people of color are, are living, like places like uh, Flint, Michigan, uh, we see that they're impacted worse uh, than more affluent uh, Community, communities and the global south we see that you know the rising water, rising tides rising water is affecting people living in the low lying lands and in islands that are in non-western countries so we do we definitely see that and we're privileged right and I, I think the one thing that's interesting or horrifying is that now people who are privileged are getting impacted by the climate crisis uh, so the wildfires for example um, and that is raising awareness and getting people to act, uh, but we also need to stand aside the people who are affected the worst as well and advocate for them. Let's thank our speakers one more time. Thank you so much for sharing your research. And I look forward to seeing the book will be coming out in May. So if you're um, interested, you can read more about their research. Um, as we conclude, I just want to remind you that we have a lot of uh, additional events that the Climate Center is hosting this semester. Our next one is on October 19th, which is next Tuesday. It's a debate. Uh, the first time we've hosted a scholarly debate, it'll be between two different people. Uh, Thomas Lindsay and Wesley Smith will be debating about uh, whether or not we should recognize rights of nature, whether that's a, a good idea that we should adopt or whether it's a bad idea. So it will be on Zoom next Tuesday. I encourage you to go to gonzaga.edu slash climate center events and check out that event as well as the others we have this semester. Thanks so much for coming today. Don't forget this will be recorded or has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. Thank you so much.